Okay. Well, Tashi Dele, welcome back to week number three of part two. And so we are continuing with the commentary from Long Chempa, looking at the basic space of phenomena text. And so we're on chapter six, All Inclusive Awakened Mind, on page 123. So here he's talking about all things being in suchness. And there's one of those words that doesn't really have a very specific meaning, but it's used a lot in various branches of Buddhist tradition as a way of referring to the ultimate and so the true nature of things. And so all of these are said here to be a part of what is unborn. So the unborn, the ultimate is unborn, it has no beginning and therefore is unborn. So the root text says, just as all light is subsumed within the sun as its source, all phenomena, excuse me, all phenomena are subsumed within the awakened mind as their source. Even the impurity and confusion in the universe of appearances and possibilities, whatever occurs by examining basic space as its matrix and abode, you find that it has no foundation, but is subsumed within the timeless freedom of mind. Beyond labels and their meanings, confusion and its absence are subsumed within the true nature of phenomena, the timeless expanse, a supremely spacious state. And so he uses a couple of metaphors to explain this, talking, for example, about sunlight. And so you have the rays of the sun versus the sun itself. And sometimes we differentiate the, between those, but without the sun, you don't have the rays. And of course, without the rays, you don't have the sun. And so uh, both of those things. Uh, and you can compare those with samsara and nirvana one way of using that as a metaphor or a dream as the dream appears but in fact doesn't exist as something substantially real and so he says samsara and nirvana never really existed okay it exists in our mind and in terms of our direct experience that's absolutely true okay everything exists everything we experience exists in our mind that's the way we perceive it, that's the way we experience it. Okay, so there's never any coming, abiding, or going as a part of that. On page 124, the third line down, he uses the phrases, awakened mind as the supportive ground, or awakened mind as basic space, has never existed as an identifiable essence. Okay. So we come up with these phrases to use to help describe these things, but we have to be careful about reifying them and making something real out of them. But conventionally, we can use those phrases, as long as we understand that the phrase is really a conventional designation, not the real thing. And then he, cre he quotes from The All-Creating Monarch, which is one of his favorites in this text. And he talks about, I subsume all phenomena, however they manifest, as a seed, as a cause, as a trunk, as a ground, as a root. All phenomena, as they manifest, are in fact me. Mm -hmm. Referring to Samatabhadra as the all-creating monarch here. And then down at the bottom of the page, he talks about the objects of the phenomenal world being subsumed within the scope of awareness. And so from the root text, he writes, even the marvelous display of awareness's own pure manifestations, the kayas, pure realms, timeless awareness, enlightened activities, is subsumed within the naturally occurring state that is not made or unmade. Okay? So we're going beyond those concepts, transcendent view. Awakened mind subsumes the universe of appearances and possibilities of all samsara, all of samsara and nirvana. Lucid and uncompounded, it can be compared to the sun shining in the empty sky. Occurring primordially and naturally, it is a spacious, timeless expanse. And then <clears throat> related to this in his explanation, he also again quotes from the all-creating monarch down the middle of the page. The true nature of phenomena that transcends everything is awakened mind. 
Awakened mind is the very heart of all phenomena. Awakened mind is the very source of all phenomena. Being the very source, it also subsumes all that has ultimate meaning. So it's all related. Continuing on the next page, 126, he introduces the vast expanse of being can be shown to be the nature of mind. And so from the root text he says, mind itself is an unchanging vast expanse, the realm of space. Its display, the dynamic energy of awakened mind, is indeterminate. In that it entails mastery over samsara, nirvana, and all spiritual approaches, this unique state in which nothing need be done outshines everything else. There is no context anywhere that constitutes an extreme. There is no straying at all from the true nature of phenomena, awakened mind. So he refers to this in the sense of basic space. Again, this being a metaphor, not the real thing. And that provides an open avenue for everything. And similarly, awakened mind is like basic space of all samsara and nirvana. So this basic space idea, if we think about space, it's infinite, it's open. And so that's the idea of the awakened mind. The awakened mind is open okay, to whatever arises without labeling, without evaluating, without establishing opinions about good, bad, and so forth. It's just open to whatever arises. And then on page 127, so in subsuming everything, awareness does not waver. So from the root text, given that everything is wholly positive, arising as a single state of spontaneous presence, that which is sublime and without rival, the greatest of the great within which everything without exception is subsumed, is the wholly positive basic space of phenomena. Since everything is united within it, as though under a monarch, it entails mastery over all samsara and nirvana and does not waver at all. It's unwavering, so it's steady, it's permanent, and so forth. Those characteristics that we use to describe something that is defined as ultimate. Then he goes on on page 128, referring to all phenomena as e neither good nor bad, and entail no effort or achievement. So from the root text, since everything is wholly positive, with not a single thing that is not positive, all things are identical within the wholly positive state in which there is neither good nor bad. Since everything whatever is or is not the case, is of the same basic space, all things are identical within the unwavering, spontaneously present state of equalness. So in this section he comments on phenomena, all phenomena here, <clears throat> as being identical in being neither good nor bad, no effort nor achievement related to them. So again, it's a little bit like the Heart Sutra here. It's not this, it's not that. Uh, and there's no acceptance or rejection, no attachment, no aversion associated with any of these. Again, he quotes then at the bottom of the page from the all-creating monarch, the characteristic of all phenomena is that of space. The characteristic of space is that of suchness itself. The characteristic of the three kayas is that of abiding in suchness. Every, <coughs> excuse me, everything abides in suchness itself. However they appear, all phenomena, just as they are, they cannot be contrived. They are neither good nor bad and entail no acceptance or rejection. That kind of duplicates what he said in a slightly different way, uh, but reinforces the idea here of being more transcendent in nature. So then he says that due to the fact that these things arise from basic space, they are beyond effort and achievement. So in the root text, he says the single state from which everything without exception arises is the basic space of phenomena. There is nothing to achieve or to seek within the context in which nothing need be done. So why would we seek something if nothing needs to be done? 
Such a sense effort and achievement are not other than their natural state of basic space. Whence could effort come? Okay, from this context, you couldn't have effort even if you wanted to, right? Effort's just an idea, a concept. To what achievement would it lead? Okay, again, it's just a concept. It's beyond the realm of this ultimate sense of things. So it's beyond achievement, it's beyond dreams. Uh, in dreams, uh, dreams are kind of pointless, right? I mean, there are some, that is some psychological value, of course, in dreams, but as an entity, there, there's nothing, no point in dreams, okay? And so antidotes, he says, are also like that. And there's nothing other than just the scope of awareness. Nothing needs to be done. Uh, the way of effort or achievement is a part of this, uh, related to mind itself, which is simply like basic space. It just is, because it can't be altered by anything. Causes, effects, karma, doesn't change it at all. Just like the mirror and the reflection. The reflection never changes the mirror. The mirror remains the same, always. Okay? All phenomena arise from it, although uh, it's, it itself is beyond the extremes of positive and negative. On page 130, he has a section here related to this idea of cause and effect, effort and achievement being transcended. So the root text says, since there is no object to seek, nothing to perceive in meditation, no state to achieve, nothing that comes from anywhere else, and no coming and going, there is equalness, dharmakaya. This spontaneous perfection is found within the basic space of the supreme sphere of being. Well, that's kind of a label, but <laughs> that's part of the conflict that we're caught in here is how do you describe it without attaching labels to it. But we do have to be very careful about not getting attached to those labels. Then he continues on on, one page, on page 131 toward the bottom about spiritual approaches being subsumed within that awareness. So first he talks about the three lower approaches. So he's going to go through the nine yanas here in groups of three. So in the first three, uh, the root text says, the transmission of the Shravakas, Prateka Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas are decisive concerning the non-existence of both the self and what pertains to it. So they are identical in their intent, a space-like state free of elaboration. The transmission of the Supreme Yoga, the sublime secret of Ati, so he's making a comparison then between those three and Ati Yoga or Dzogchen, is that of resting in the genuine being just as it is, naturally occurring timeless awareness within the spacious state in which there is no distinction between self and other. So yeah, you might say it's neither attachment nor non-attachment. Okay? It's beyond those detached. And continuing on the next page, so the ultimate meaning of the enlightened perspectives of all three lower approaches is subsumed within the sublime heart essence. So all three of those views, valid views, but they're also absorbed within this view of Ati Yoga or Dzogchen. So he comments a little bit on that about the, the Shravaka's view of external and internal phenomena, the Pacheka view related to uh, phenomena that are reified as objects in the Bodhisattvas, of uh, things that are reified as subject and object and that all of these lack any inherent existence. And so then the great perfection embraces this suchness of phenomena. It's empty and yet lucid. So this is the same term that is used as Buddha nature, the luminous emptiness. So then the next one is to talk about the three intermediate levels or approaches. <clears throat> and so the root text says the three approaches of Kriya, Upa, and Yoga, moreover, which employ oneself, 
deity, meditative absorption, and clouds of offerings are identical in holding that spiritual attainment comes from the complete purification of body, speech, and mind. So in those three approaches, the heavy emphasis on this purification process. However, according to the secret and most majestic transmission of the Vajra Pentacle, so comparing it now again with Atta Yoga, appearances, sounds, and awareness are completely pure, timelessly the deity. So they're already pure, there's nothing to do. Spiritual attainment is fully evident as the complete purity of body, speech, and mind. And, also, and so the enlightened perspectives of all these approaches are subsumed within this sublime heart essence. So Kriya Tantra, we have the spiritual attainment from thinking of oneself as a servant in, and the deity as a master. So there's the offerings, the praises, and, and so forth as a part of that. The Upa Tantra, uh, we look at the deity as the expression of timeless awareness and typically is viewed as being in front of oneself. So we're kind of at the same level, if you will. Yoga Tantra, the deity is dissolved into the mandala. And so the offerings, praises, and so forth are offered to purify body, speech, and mind as a part of that. And so all of these, their perspectives are subsumed then within the approach of Atta Yoga, which is the awakened mind. So he quotes from the all-creating monarch, Within the mandala of the sublime, naturally occurring heart essence, if body, speech, and mind rest in a relaxed state, just as they are, they are spontaneously present as the enlightened intent of me, the all-creating one. Again, me here being Samatabhadra, the ultimate. So then it gets to the three higher approaches, the, the upper levels of highest Yoga Tantra. So in the three stages of Maha, Anu, and Ati, moreover, the universe of appearances and possibilities is a pure realm of masculine and feminine deities. These stages hold that the unwavering nature of phenomena is naturally occurring timeless awareness. For basic space and timeless awareness are inseparable in their total purity. Given that everything is completely pure within this sublime, excellent secret, the immeasurable mansion, without being created, is a blissful realm, a timeless expanse. Within this infinite and all-pervasive state, which cannot be divided into outer and inner, there is nothing to characterize in light of your value judgments. With everything timelessly infinite, the spacious expanse of Dharmakaya, the enlightened perspectives of all these approaches are subsumed within the heart essence of the Supreme Secret. So here he's using the Sarma divisions uh, in terms of the highest yoga tantra. So the Maha Yoga referring to the father tantras and the Anu Yoga referring to the mother tantras. And awareness is the ground aspect of the mandala and the universe, the deities, the mansion, and timeless awareness, all in unity associated with this. And through doing that, attaining that sense of unity, we achieve enlightenment, which in the tantric practices is often referred to as bliss emptiness, a heavy emphasis on this transcendent bliss, if you will. And so here then he compares that with Ati Yoga again and says everything is understood always to be a mandala of Buddhahood. It is the ultimate approach because ultimate heart essence is subsumed within it. So all of these approaches, all of the material within this is subsumed within Ati Yoga. So you'll see descriptions in some texts that talk about Ati as including everything else, all of the different sources. It's already included. 
and even find phrases that say, so what need is there to do any of this other stuff? And to some degree that's correct, but if they're careful in how they articulate that, they will say, for a certain few people who have extraordinary capabilities, you can do that, but most of us really need to get some groundwork and foundation upon which to build the ATI. And so that really refers to most of us. Down at the bottom of the page then, he says, now everything is subsumed within this perfect and perfect within awakened mind. And so from the root text he says, perfection in one, perfection in everything. The expanse within which all phenomena are subsumed is itself subsumed within the supreme state of spontaneous presence, a timeless and naturally lucid state of utter relaxation. So everything is perfect within that state. So if we're not within that state, sorry, <laughs> it's not perfect, it's samsara, okay? There are problems going on. But to the extent that we can be within that state, we see things in the, from that ultimate view, from the ultimate view, as being perfect. But we recognize, even as a Buddha, we recognize and we have deep compassion for the suffering of all beings that don't recognize that, okay? So it's not that we see it as absolutely perfect, ah, oh, there's nothing wrong, and that's not the case, okay? We still recognize, we still know that there is a lot of suffering going on out there. So uh, there's this perfection of oneness, there's the perfection in duality, and there is perfection in everything. He also then quotes again from the all-creating uh, monarch down at the bottom of 135 there, although they do, they who dwell in the state in which nothing need be done may look like ordinary individuals such as gods and humans, their enlightened intent is in accord with the true nature of phenomena. They are Buddhas. So having that enlightened intent, remember in the Bodhisattva, the, the definition of bodhicitta, the very first part is that intent. And the enlightened or awakened mind is often used as the description of the definition of bodhicitta as a part of that. But it includes both the relative and the ultimate. So that includes this chapter, the all-inclusive awakened mind. 